Good morning, everyone, and welcome to America's Hottest Brands, our virtual event offering a look behind the scenes of some of the buzziest brands in business. I'm Adrienne Pasquarelli, Senior Reporter at Ad Age. Earlier this week, we published our annual list of the 20 brands making a splash with consumers today. The lineup includes newcomers like Clubhouse, which has filled a connections void in the last year, and long-established companies like Pfizer, the pharmaceutical giant is now a frequent part of mainstream conversation, thanks to its recent distinction as the hot person vaccine. The list also includes trends like NFTs and Space Jam, the rebooted film starring LeBron James. Space Jam doesn't open until Friday, but it has already been a boon for brands eager to collaborate. Today, you'll be hearing firsthand from the executives behind some of the brands on our list about how they found success, and what comes next as society returns to pre-pandemic life. We're hoping to leave you with some valuable lessons you can apply to your own companies. We'll be talking about the new breed of retail and what trends we can expect. We'll also host a fireside chat with Unique Jones Gibson, the founder of Culture Tags, the hashtag based card game that's taking social circles and the retail aisle at, at Target by storm. And later this afternoon, we'll host a talk with executives from sports gambling site DraftKings and cannabis brand Cookies on the challenges they are facing by marketing amid ever-changing state regulations. Thank you to our co-presenting sponsors, Permutive and Upwork. I want to remind everyone tuning in to please feel free to ask questions on our social feeds, and we'll do our best to get to them at the end of our conversation. And let us know where you're watching from. Our first panel takes a look at the evolution we've seen in retail over the last 18 months. E-commerce sales have skyrocketed. In some cases, retailers have seen the digital sector double compared to pre-pandemic levels. At the same time, new ways of enticing customers have emerged like live streaming and the idea of shopping as entertainment. Yet maintaining momentum can be tricky. We have a great panel with us today to tell us about how they plan to continue to grow their brands. Please welcome our panelists. Jason Brown, Chief Marketing Officer at Live Streaming App Network. Ed Plummer, Chief Marketing Officer at Dick Sporting Goods. And Dennis Seidel, Chief Brand Officer of Healthcare Apparel Brand Figs. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thanks for having Thanks, us. Thanks, Adrian. Thank you. So you each hail from a different sector of retail, but you're all seeing success by tapping into different trends. Let's each talk about the kind of new consumer behavior that you've seen as a result of the pandemic. Um, Jason, do you want to start? Sure, absolutely. Um, and first and foremost, Adrian, again, thank you guys for having us and on behalf of the entire network team. I want to let you guys know how honored we are to be named on Ad Age's hottest brands list. It's a really huge deal for us. And I think uh, on, on the network side, what's probably different for us is the fact that we're conditioning the, the U.S. retail consumer to shop in a different way. And I do think that the pandemic gave us the opportunity with the, the minimal distractions that, that were happening at that time. They were much more acceptable and palatable in terms of being able to try and experiment something. And I think we were able to benefit from the fact that the consumers actually really, really enjoyed that experience. And it really showed through a lot of the metrics and the data and analytics that we have. So we're definitely trying to maintain that momentum and, and keep the train going and delivering that best in class experience for our consumers. 
And what about you? Have you guys noticed any big changes in the last year compared to the previous five in terms of how your consumers are shopping, what they're looking for? Yeah, we. Uh, it, it feels like it feels like almost everything changed. So, so we've seen two big changes. One is really around um, the way consumers shop. So, um, so we closed our stores in March of 2020. Um, they were closed for for several weeks, and and at and at that time, um, customers still wanted to shop us, um, and they would shop us online, which was great. But there was still a, a contingent of customers that wanted to shop the store. So, we had been working on technology for for years, um, and 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 our technology team was in a great place. They spun up curbside in forty eight hours. Um, and curbside just became this just exploded across retail and it's 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 been something that that with the new environment i don't think is going away we still continue to invest in curbside so so i think consumers flock more towards the internet they were already heading there but curbside was 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 something that really wasn't a thing before and is and is 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 an enormous channel for us now um, and it's something that, that I expect is here to stay. The, the second way for us specifically was that, that, that there was a huge change in consumer lifestyles. So, um, you know, we were ramping up for team sports when COVID hit. Well, team sports, you know, largely went away in the, in the spring and, and people were, were interested in getting outside because they were stuck in their home. So we saw people flock to running and, and kayaking. We saw people building their, their, their home gyms inside of their home. So we really saw this movement towards um, towards wellness and 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 physical activity that that we saw really just explode during COVID. So really, it was it was around how they shopped and it was around what they were buying. And of course, the trend in wellness has been a big one for Figs. Um, Dennis, you probably have, have noticed some changes in, in consumer behavior, and I'm, I'm also wondering how your brand was able to kind of tap into that if, if you changed your strategies at all when healthcare was really at the forefront of, of so much of the conversation last year. Yeah, I mean, I think at the macro level, um, consumer, be everything was accelerated last year, right? We, we all talked about how the fact, how the DTC model and sort of immediacy of internet shopping um, was accelerated with, within a matter of months, well, what probably would have taken years from a consumer adoption perspective. I think um, the the expectations for consumers to get things now, whether that's a curbside pickup or whether that's overnight shipping, um, that has only been amplified. I think for us, it's interesting because we are a DTC brand. We don't have any brick and mortar locations. Um, for us, it was really about doubling down on, on our operations and making sure that we get um, scrubs and figs to our consumers immediately, especially during the pandemic when um, the need for scrubs was so much higher. The only other thing that we did is we really doubled down on uh, PPE, so uh, protective equipment. Um, we actually went to develop when we immediately when we saw that there was a shortage of N95 masks, we got N95 masks, donated hundreds of thousands of them to the right hospitals. Um, through our data, we know exactly where those needs are. And so we were able to provide those. And then second of all, uh, through our product design team, we really went into developing a high def face shield, um, which is uh, one of the industry standards now. And Jason, I'm wondering how, how your brand was able to effectively tap into the changing behavior with everyone on their phone, so much time downtime, as, as you mentioned. Did you use any, or did Network, because I know it was before your time there, did they use any specific strategies? Definitely. And um, I think it's very similar to the, to the comment that was just made in terms of us having a lot of plans in place and the pandemic really accelerating those plans. So given that we are predicated on live streaming, that is very content production heavy. The majority of all the content that we shot, it was pretty much 80% in studio. And then one of the gifts and the curses of being a very small startup is that we can be nimble and adapt. So what we needed to do was really shift that production to being more of a remote uh, processing strategy. So in addition to the content that we create on our own, the creators, brand designers, et cetera, that really make up the marketplace that produce and stream content from remote environments. 
that was something that we already wanted to pursue and the pandemic definitely accelerated that. And now our trajectory is swinging to where we're much more focused on accelerating the, the breadth of creators that are activating on a remote basis compared to where we were before. And, and one of the things we noticed is that consumers actually really enjoy that intimate sort of one-on-one -on -one uh, lo-fi production more so than they do a huge studio with bright lights and teleprompters and all that good stuff. So it ended up working in our favor in terms of us being able to take advantage of the situation and still deliver that top-notch experience to consumers. Yeah, it feels like it's a little more authentic and that's probably what, what your customers are looking for. Definitely more personal, yeah. Um, Ed, what about what about the folks at, at Dix? Are, what brand and marketing um, priorities have you found to be effective ways of connecting with customers during the pandemic? Yeah, um, it's a good question. I, I would say the underlying way in, in which we operate didn't didn't change. We, I, I've been at Dix for almost 11 years and it, it's unbelievable to me how adaptable and, and quick this organization moves, which I think is like a lot of retail. But in terms of like what then changed, we, I, I mean, we had to, we, we really had to move quickly because we, I talked a little bit about a lot of the categories changed in terms of what people were interested in. It wasn't team sports now. Now it was, now it was, you know, outdoor equipment and it was at home fitness. And these were always important categories to us, but they really blew up during, during COVID. Um, the other thing was really, it was really um, how we talk to customers from a brand perspective. So one of the things we saw a lot of people doing were these kind of, we're all in this together, you know, soft piano music in the background type of type of ad. And, and it was, it almost made it just more depressing. And, and we wanted to put some optimism out into the marketplace and inspire people to get out and, and do what you can do within, within what is really a pretty terrible situation that people don't really know how to be in. So we launched See You Out There from a brand perspective, which encouraged people to get outdoors and, and take advantage of, of the time to, to be with family and to get outdoors and, and to do something that maybe you wouldn't have done before. So that marketing helped tap into some of the new trends you were seeing too with the outdoor sports and, and the running, some of the solo activities um, yeah, that it, were safe at the time. It was a spot, it was a spot we wouldn't have run pre-COVID because it, were, it wasn't the activities that were taking off. I mean, it really was something we had to spin up quite quickly and, and it just, and I think the world's getting that way where you just have to be more adaptable and more flexible and you've got to be open to just, you know, the, you, it, an annual plan doesn't work anymore. You, you set the annual plan and it falls apart, you know, 60 days into the year. And, and this was this was that this was that really on steroids. Are you guys finding that your, your strategies, your plannings are happening much, much faster to when they when they hit um, hit the channels? Like is how how much has that window, that planning window for marketing shrunk? Gosh, for, um, for marketing, it's I mean, look, you always want six or eight months it, it, last last year in March of 2020. It, it, it shrunk down to weeks. I mean, we didn't know when we closed the stores how long stores were going to be how long stores are going to be closed. And so you're, you know, you're optimizing for e-commerce performance and programmatic and digital channels. And then, you know, stores aren't closed as long as you think they're going to be closed. And so now you're spinning it back up and then people start to play team sports in different parts of the country. So you spin that up regionally. Like it, it just, it, and I, it's still that way. I mean, I mean, it's, it's, it's been great from a, from a, from a sales perspective and, and you kind of hope it continues, but it's on, you gotta be on your toes all the time right now because you just don't know where it's gonna, where it's gonna go next. Now, Dennis, Fixes is for healthcare professionals, but many in the industry have, have started wearing, wearing your scrubs um, for many reasons, but I'm wondering if how that plays a role in, in the marketing that you guys are doing. Are you marketing to those customers at all or are you really um, focused on, on healthcare professionals? You know, we're, we're pretty laser focused on healthcare professionals. Um, we're, we're fairly new in this space in, in this category at large. You know, I think if, if you just step back for a second and look at why we exist, right? We exist to um, empower, celebrate and serve healthcare professionals and really those who serve others. And so if we put things through that lens, um, the 
the big big thing for us is innovation, right? And I know that word gets thrown around a lot, but there was no innovation within this category before we before we existed. So we do that through product, um, but then we also do that through experiences and content. Um, I think just to add even to what Ed was saying, when when the world was doing the piano music and we're in this together, we, we did the exact same thing. We flipped just like Ed did and we launched one of our biggest brand campaigns in the middle of 2020 called New Icons. That's where we as a brand for the first time ever put healthcare professionals, whether they're pediatric transport nurses like Lexi, we put those on Times Square billboards, right? So the way that the world has looked up to celebrities and athletes, we have now put the healthcare professionals that have served the world onto the pedestal, right? And so that is that is a complete pivot of how this category has been communicated in the past. And are those healthcare professionals, are they part of your brand ambassador program or is that something separate? Um, the, the ones that we've put, uh, shine a spotlight on are definitely part of our ambassador program. Our ambassador program is um, arguably best in class. Uh, we've got, um, you know, over 250 ambassadors on our program that we leverage, leverage and integrate and really, really serve um, every single day. We speak to them daily. We have an incredible ambassador program um, and management team that has those one-on-one -on -one relationships with, with them and conversations daily. Are any of you testing new marketing channels? Um, and things like TikTok. I mean, Clubhouse um, is also on. Was also on our list. I'm, I'm wondering what you found. If, if there have been new things that you've been experimenting with during this time, Jason, was, was it? Would would definitely say yes. And just given the nature of us entering live streaming commerce, it's it's imperative that we try and test new things on a regular basis. And I think what's great about how we positioned ourselves is that we don't necessarily look at TikTok or any of the other platforms that are exploring uh, live entertainment as competition. TikTok is actually one of our biggest brand partners as well. So not only do we partner with them with our own TikTok channel and, and executions that we do against there, TikTok is also on our platform as well. And that's one of the things that I definitely continue to reiterate with the team is that we need to continuously experiment and try new and different ways to engage with our audience on a regular basis. Because when you also look at the breadth of products that we sell, the art community might be more so on one platform and you think about fashion or you think about sneakers or you think about collectibles, it could very well be another platform. And that's one of the things that we're continuously refining is when, where we decide to engage with consumers based on what their specific interest set is. Right, because it's so different for, for each person. Now, Ed, right. I know TikTok has been a big source of, of interest for Dix. Is that yeah. right? It, starting yeah. last year, right? Yeah, starting last year with back to school, and and we're 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 going to double down on back to school this year. I again, it's one of those things. I mean, TikTok TikTok gained traction so quickly, and, and it's so different than some of the other social media channels. So we um, for back to school this year, we actually used. Um, teen influencers to help us develop and, and critique the campaign and help us ideate on the campaign. So TikTok is a big, is going to be a big channel again for us and back to school. And again, we're going to, we're going to lean into the optimism and the excitement and, and our, our spots this year, very excited about and they're high energy and, and they, it, it's, it's what we think kids want. They, they want to go back to school. They want to be with their friends. I, I can't even imagine what it must have been like to do school from behind a computer screen last year. It would not have, would not have served me well as uh, as a teenager. But yeah, we're 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 going to lean into uh, TikTok, some of the other social channels, and uh, and a heavy use of influencers this year to 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 drive what I think is a pretty optimistic, energetic campaign. Now I want to come back to to back to school and maybe talk a little bit about holiday too as we look ahead. But before that, we have a couple shout outs that I want to um, say. Uh, we have Tasha from Illinois, Abigail from North Carolina. Muhammad from Pakistan, Laura from California, and Kathy from Pennsylvania. Thank you all for watching. And if you are just joining us, I'm Adrian Pascarelli with AdAge. I'm joined by Ed Plummer of Dick Sporting Goods, Jason Brown of Network, and Dennis Seidel of Figs. If you have any questions for our panelists, please leave them in the chat, and we'll try to get to them at the end of the session. Now, Jason, I want to ask you a little bit about your background. Um, now, 
you were at, at Foot Locker until fairly recently when, when you joined Network. I'm wondering if you found any similarities between the two, between the two companies that you've been able or you plan to use to your advantage. Absolutely. Um, Foot Locker, an amazing company, so proud of the work that we've done there. And as you can imagine, I would say that the biggest similarity is that Foot Locker and Network are both rooted in youth culture and everything that both companies do is all about being credible and authentic in that youth culture space how they both go how they both go about that conversation and marketing to consumers is a bit different and i think one sort of misnomer about network is that a lot of people seem to think that we're you know really big on sneakers and footwear and it is definitely part of our product offering but it's also the probably the sixth or seventh uh as it relates to where it sits in in the amount of product that we sell so art collectibles home goods all of those categories are actually larger than what we do on the footwear space and then obviously Foot Locker has a massive real estate footprint across the country across the world whereas network only has one formal distribution outlet. So I'd say that's where the similarities come in and, and the difference is obviously in that sort of in channel in terms of where we're communicating with our consumers and transacting. Now, your brands have all been very successful, but it's still been a challenging time. I'm wondering what one big challenge um, for you has been and, and how you've been able to overcome it. And I'm wondering if Dennis, you can take this one. Sure. Um, look, I think a lot, the way we've built our brand over the last decade has really been um, through a way of connection, right? Um, the, if you look at the world of healthcare and healthcare professionals, medical professionals really have in the past lived in their own little lanes of professions. We've tried to break that, right? We really wanted to create a community for healthcare professionals where that community never existed. So leading up to COVID, you know, we leaned a lot into like physical experiences, immersion weekends. So really getting people together, um, which was obviously very, very difficult in, in 2020. Um, so what we ended up doing, to, to go back to your earlier questions, we really did lean into Clubhouse. We really did lean into social for connections. We hosted a lot of IG lives. Um, we really leaned into you know, our TikTok community as well to continue that community connection. I think that was, that was a big change for us to go from you know physical experiences to really continuing that community feel, but in a digital space. So we can't wait now that the world's back open and get people back together. Well, speaking of physical, um, we've heard so much about the rise in e-commerce during the pandemic, and that's definitely benefited Dix, uh, where digital sales doubled last year, I think. Is that right, Ed? Right. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you're, you're in the right neighborhood. <laughs> But what about physical retail? Now, Dick's just opened an experiential store with a climbing wall and a track and, and all kinds of great things. Ed, why is the brand betting on brick and mortar? And, and how do these new stores fit into your strategy? Uh, we Look, we, we believe in stores. They, they and we believe the stores are, are, a, are a significant part of our of our future success. We think people like shopping in stores. When it comes to sporting goods, we think people like trying things on and touching things. Um, and a store, the stores have really become a hub for us. Um, you know, we have we have over 800 stores across our chains, across the country, where people can they can they can come in and shop. They can they can shop us curbside. But it also serves as a hub for for ship from stores. So we we really believe stores are powerful, and with the with the house of sport stores, um, it, it's really a double down on 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 physical locations where we we've given people a reason to stick around because we have a climbing wall, or we have an outdoor field, or we have you know these we have expansive golf hitting bays. So we believe that there is a future in brick and mortar retail. We have a strong online business that did great for us last year, continues to do well for us. We also believe the stores are, a, are, are the hub of this business and, and they, they, serve a, they, they serve the customer in a way that the customer can't just be served with, with an online channel. Now we do have an audience question uh, from YouTube and it is for Jason. Um, this person is wondering, where does network stand with college students? 
So I'm assuming that question might be as it relates to our demographic. So the majority of the people that are on the network app are pretty much 18 to 24. Uh, I do think that college students, I would say, are also synonymous with youth culture, which is, you know, what everything that we do is based on youth culture, whether that's sports, music, fashion, art, et cetera. So I can't necessarily pull out if there is something more specific as it relates to do we specifically mark, market to colleges and universities? I'd say that we're much more focused on youth culture than we are specifically targeting colleges and universities, if that's the question. So kind of looking into the trends that are resonating with, with youth culture. Exactly. Um, and, and how are you using some of these trends when it comes to the types of brands that you're partnering with at Network? No, absolutely. We have a, a tremendous merchandise team who is not only looking at, you know, the current trends, but they're also forecasting, you know, when you we hear the term influencer a lot, but who are those people that have historically set trends and what does it look like in 2022 and beyond? So I think we're doing a great job in making sure that we're having the right conversations looking at historical trends and always testing out new and different things. So I think that's how we've been able to make sure that we keep that thumb on the pulse. Now, Dennis, right now, FIGS is online and direct to consumer, as you mentioned. Are there any plans to, to wholesale or open your own shops, getting into some of that um, you know, physical location that Ed was just talking about? Yeah, you know, the DTC model is working really well for us. Um, I think I think the it allows us to really capture so much data and the more data we have, the better we can serve them knowing what they want going to want in the future. Um, I think from a, from an experiential perspective, experiential, like I mentioned, is really important for us. Um, in the past, we've dabbled in pop-up stores. We've done a pop-up store in New York city. Uh, we've done a pop-up store right here on Melrose. Um, those are, those have always been really well received by our community because they can again, touch and feel the product. Um, you know, we, we can launch partnerships that way. We can go through programming and, and um, host some great events that way and connect with our community. So I would think experiential, yes, we will absolutely go there, but there's currently no plans for uh, brick and mortar. There might be as we scale globally, um, but it's not in the on the roadmap today. Makes sense. Uh, well, we have a, a few minutes left and I definitely want to get into a little more about the future. Um, now, Ed, you, we already started talking a little bit about back to school. I know you guys have a campaign coming out next week. Tell us a little bit more about how the campaign this year might compare to last year, specifically because so many kids are going back into classrooms and will need so many different materials than they might have for, for a virtual environment in, in 2020. Yeah, we're we're really leaning into the emotion of back to school this year. So so I, I again I, I think it was a tough year for for kids last year. We 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 think there's a lot of excitement around coming back. Um, we think there's there's we think that's the piece we want to lead lean into. I um, we you know we continue to lead with with Dix as a place to shop for. For, for anything back to school, whether it's whether it's the latest trends in style or whether it's backpacks or water bottles. Um, and we'll continue to showcase that our back to school advertising, but we also think it's really important to lean into the emotion. Um, so we're gonna lean into the emotion in film, but then TikTok, um, as we talked about before, will lean into um, kids sharing their looks um, and it'll be, it'll be, you know, they'll create their own kind of mini lookbook within TikTok and share it with others. And then we're also doing a a, um, a lock-in with our influencers uh, at the beginning of August, where we'll have the influencers in the store for we basically give them, give them the keys to the store and and see what they can come up from a style perspective and, and share that share that out with their followers. But we're we're leaning into both sides. We're leaning we're leaning into the optimism around being able to get back, and then we're you know we continue to lean into you know the fact that we have the hot product that, that kids want for going back to school. Jason, how do you plan to continue the momentum network has seen as people might be less focused on, on the online experience? 
So I think one of the things that we're really focused on during the pandemic, um, you know, similar to what both of these gentlemen were saying earlier, at times we would sort of latch on to various in real life events, whether that be Coachella, doing pop up shops and things of that nature. But we started this idea of creating our own digital festivals during the pandemic. And it's something that worked tremendously well. And what we've decided to do is really expand the breadth of what those digital festivals could be. So we've already had almost one every single month this year with uh, the most recent one being Staple Day where we partner with world famous sneaker designer, Jeff Staple. And it was not only about sneakers, but also all the other things that he designed as well. So for the balance of the year, we have uh, four more festivals. So one specifically, we have Medicon, which is all about gaming. We know how huge gaming is to our customer. We also have a partnership with FaZe Clan, one of the biggest uh, groups in the gaming industry. We also have Open House, a two day festival all about home goods. And then we also have uh, a huge announcement this week that I wish I could talk about on this platform, but uh, you'll see that news coming, but we're really excited between the news coming out, the festivals, and a lot of the partnership deals that we have on the table to continue that momentum for the balance of the year. Well, I can't wait to hear about that news that you can't mention today. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, Dennis, uh, last question for you. What's ahead for Figs and, and where do you see the brand focusing in, in 2022? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, look, I think the biggest thing for us is as we get to know more and more of our customers, we're really looking at FIGS as the lifestyle brand for healthcare professionals, right? We build performance product for healthcare professionals. And that is not just scrubs, that is not just in the hospital, but really looking at the category and really the consumer. What do they need to get to work? What do they need at work? And what do they need to um, at home, right? And so we've actually developed um, uh, an on-shift fleece jacket, which is specifically designed for hospital environments because hospital environments temperatures are uh, ranging vastly between, you know, um, cold and cold and hot. Um, our product is designed for that. A lot of the product that was designed in the past was designed for maybe mountaineering that people are wearing. And so we're designing specifically for that person with that person in mind. And then I think the sec second piece is, you know, we, we have a huge opportunity to continue to drive awareness. So launching a, um, a massive brand campaign that really celebrates these awesome humans um, as we refer to healthcare professionals later in the year um, is going to be a big, big moment for us. Great. Well, I can't wait to see all of this, um, but now we're out of time. Uh, Ed, Jason and Dennis, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks. Thanks, for having you, us. Thanks. Up next, Studio 30 chats with Elizabeth Brennan of Permutive, one of our sponsors. Hi everyone, it's Natalie Zafat, Ad Age Contributing Editor. A few weeks ago, Google turned the advertising industry on its head when they announced their new cookie reprieve. Today, I am joined by Permutive Head of Advertising Strategy, Elizabeth Brennan, who's gonna give us a glimpse into a first party data-based advertising ecosystem, and also tell us why brands shouldn't crumble, excuse the pun, under Google's new cookie reprieve. Welcome, Elizabeth. Hi, thank you so much for having me today. Of course, thanks for being here. The last time we connected, Google had just announced their cookie reprieve, and it felt like the advertising industry was sort of unraveling. Uh, you kept your cool, though. You said to me that brands shouldn't operate in a legacy way, but they sort of crumble when any technology company releases news. So I wonder, how did Permutive sort of help market in a privacy-safe way while still staying robust enough to not be threatened by some of these industry changes? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's such a tricky time for marketing people at the moment to to not kind of feel worried every time um, any tech company or um, privacy regulator puts news out into into the press. It's a very kind of confusing and chaotic time. But I really think that particularly um, for uh, the brands who are watching us today, kind of really up and coming brands, it doesn't make sense to work in a way that is um, compromised from privacy. And as you say, a legacy way of working. Cookies have been around for decades, and we know that there are privacy regulations coming down the road. The way that Permutive helps advertisers and publishers to behave in a privacy safe way is because um, none of our technology really relies on working with cookies. 
We've developed technology that allows publishers to effectively understand all of the users who come to their site um, and target them for advertising without that data ever kind of leaking out of that ecosystem. And from an advertiser's point of view, we have built an infrastructure to allow them to not only make sense of their own fast first party data without that, again, leaking into the ecosystem, um, but also kind of collaborate with publishers in order to build really smart targeting strategies that, that do not compromise privacy. One of the problems with privacy um, at the moment is that data goes around an ecosystem um, sort of willy-nilly um, and an awful lot of data is, is sitting within that ecosystem. It's taken out of where the data is created and what that means is that the owners of that data lose control over it and user privacy is compromised. Um, in the permitted ecosystem, that's not happening. Um, so the data owners remain in control of their data, whether that's an advertiser or a publisher, and all we're doing is facilitating that connection. Elizabeth, I wonder if you can tell us what advertisers need to do in the wake of the new cookie reprieve. Absolutely. I think it's quite confusing for advertisers at the moment. There's news coming out, not only from, from Google, but from Apple as well, about what their different policies are. Um, and certainly the Google News has thrown a few people into kind of chaos and what are we going to do and we've started down this journey for me personally i think the google news just speaks to how difficult this issue is to solve and how complex it is and ingrained into into the ways that we're working today i think advertisers if anything need to kind of really take the ball by the horns and build their kind of test and learn but i think what's really important is rather than even looking at kind of the the individual news stories that, that might be coming out is privacy is coming like kind of a juggernaut down the road uh, behind us. And there's nothing that we can do to kind of stop that, regardless of what one player, one party might be saying is, is their approach to that. Um, the reality is that regulators are um, really going to be very strict about how data can be used. Um, and that's not going to change. I think also, Google are their own company and they are at liberty to change their policies uh, whenever they like. And if given this kind of new deadline, but that doesn't mean that the deadline can't change and it could come forwards or backwards. So I think for advertisers who want to kind of give themselves a bit of comfort, um, it's really for them about taking control of, of what they can. And, and that means being um, aware of what first party data they have in their businesses, understanding where that sits, understanding how they can activate that. Um, it's about understanding which strategic partnerships they need to form uh, with other first party data owners. And that could be um, retailers, that could be publishers, but really people who they can collaborate with to expand the reach of their own first party data, which we all kind of acknowledge will be limited. And then it's about working with like infrastructure partners. So the infrastructure that works today, there are parts of that that will still work and there are parts of it that, that won't. And within their own technology stacks, it's really important that they understand where the risks are and what new partners they need to bring on board that help them to navigate this, this new world. And whilst, of course, they can still continue to work with cookies that, um, in Chrome, actually, if you look at Safari and you look at Firefox, which is about 40% of the internet usage today, um, you still can't reach people there with cookies. Um, and I think particularly if you're a high fashion brand, high fashion retailer, it's kind of imperative that you can reach people on, the, on those devices. Um, you know, Safari users spend more than people who spend on Android or other desktops. And so it's important to think about your audience strategy holistically. And yes, kind of uh, Chrome is the majority of browsing. But if you are a nuanced brand, if you're a, um, an up and coming brand that needs to reach um, influential, highly affluent people, if you can't reach people on Safari and, and the news that Apple put it, is putting out is that they, they really are taking privacy seriously. Um, you know, the notion that people can kind of um, block email addresses going into that system. What that means is that one to one targeting becomes even more difficult. The result of that is that strategic partnerships with publishers or, again, other data owners who do understand holistically and um, everyone that's coming within their environment is even more important to continue to reach people there. I wonder if we can take a deeper dive into the data, because it seems to me that there's sort of this bigger data problem, if you will. Yeah. Um, 
you said that people need to be more aware of how data is being used and not expect that it's going to be protected. Um, I wonder what are some of those best practices that you think consumers should be aware of and how do you communicate to your customers to help them feel secure? Yeah, I think um, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I think privacy was kind of an industry thing that we were a bit worried about. We knew it wasn't working particularly well. Now it's on the mainstream. I was listening to a radio program earlier today on the BBC and people were phoning in and talking about data and cookies and their own information. And what that means as an advertiser is if you do list all the information, sorry, all the people who are capturing information on your site, all of a sudden consumers become aware that a lot of this data on them is being collected. That's not necessarily a bad thing if it's for analytics, personalization, etc. I think it can be confusing for customers when there are providers on there that they don't recognize or that there are sort of several hundred providers um, listed um, as collecting information on, on any site. And that kind of feels a bit like, oh, my goodness, how are these people collecting and, and understanding my data? I think from a brand's point of view, it's about explaining to people how your data is being collected, how your data is being used and also being incredibly clear on the value exchange. So. If you collect data as a brand uh, for a competition entry, let's say, or let's say um, I was a brand that um, I was a stock cube brand and I was sharing recipes, then somebody might want to log in, create a list of favorites. You know, the value exchange there is incredibly clear. Equally, if I want to use that for advertising, I don't think consumers mind that as long as they understand what's happening with that data. So we are going to collect your email address. We are going to use it for marketing. If you don't want us to do that, this is the opt out here. Um, and I think it's about that transparency between uh, a brand or, or any other um, website owner and, and the end consumer, because I think when that transparency isn't there, people kind of make up their own truth. And that's where a lot of the confusion comes from, I think. I think that's a really important distinction um, with regards to transparency and expectations. Um, I wonder if we could play this out for a minute. What does a first party database advertising ecosystem look like? Of course, it's a great question. So a first party database um, advertising ecosystem is a little bit different for brands than it is for let's say publishers. So publisher first party data, they're able to collect that on everyone who comes to their site. So their site data is first party data. What does an individual look at? What are their interests? And that stays within their own environment. From a brand, their first party data is um, who purchases. So for a brand, let's say a fashion media site like Everlane, who has very strong kind of transparency uh, values, then they might be able to have um, email addresses on everybody that's converted on their website. Uh, then let's say um, the tablet toothpaste parlor and they too will have a very strong first party data collection that, that enables them to, um, because everyone uh, transacts on their website. Um, brands that suffer a little bit more tend to be the ones uh, that have bricks and mortar sales strategies um, and they won't have so much first party data. But what they can do where a brand can supplement their data uh, for targeting is by partnering with publishers who have this full understanding of everyone that comes to their site. So a first party data advertising ecosystem is one in which an advertiser can take their login data um, or their transaction data, providing that's consented to be used for advertising and activate that on a publishers, which is going to have limited scale, but will have very rich um, implications in terms of insights. And for a publisher, it means I can activate not just those who are logged in, but also my entire ecosystem, as long as I remain in control of that data. Really helpful. Thanks for walking us through that. I wonder how that type of an ecosystem would change the relationships between brands and agencies and publishers. And maybe if I can ask one more question, how would ad tech support that? Such a great question. Um, I think the rules of the game are changing a little bit. And um, what we've had in this world, which we operate in today, is like efficiency at the heart of the ecosystem. Machines talking to machines doing a, you know, an incredible job. If you want to hit an ROI or you want to hit a cost per acquisition, this ecosystem is built to do that. The relationships are changing fundamentally between a brand, um, an advertiser and an agency. The rules of the game are changing and certainly like the power shift and the power dynamics are changing. 
in a world where we've put efficiency at the heart of the ecosystem, an advertiser and an agency is really setting the agenda. They're saying, this is the CPA I need you to hit, this is the ROI I need you to hit, and a publisher is working as, as best they can in order to achieve that. When you start to put humanity back at the ecosystem, when you start to put privacy at the heart of the ecosystem, actually it's data owners who really have an awful lot of the control. And those people tend to be publishers because um, as we talked about earlier, Natalie, they have this kind of first party relationship with everyone who comes to their site. And so what's happening is the value um, is shifting back into publisher first party data. What that means for an advertiser is they need to have direct connections into publishers and they need to form and build these strategic relationships. For an agency, whilst they've always been a strategic partner to their advertising um, colleagues, it means that the sort of the nature of the strategy that they need to deliver is slightly different. Because whereas they might have been saying, we can deliver this all through real time bidding, um, we can drive towards your CPA, it's all of a sudden it's who's going to be strategically important for you, who's going to have the right first party data, what's the nature of those relationships. And I think for an advertiser to be told, you know, you need to have a direct relationship with the publisher, they kind of understand the why, but they've no idea how to go about sort of forming those relationships a lot of the time. And particularly for advertisers who are newer to marketing, that can seem like a really daunting task. And so agencies have got a really important role to play there in terms of supporting their customers through this kind of, this new world, helping them to, to navigate it. Really important distinction and, and thanks for that extra color. Um, Thanks so much, Elizabeth, for joining us today. It's great to have a chat with you. I'm gonna kick it over to Jessica Wall, Ad Age Senior Reporter for our next panel. Thanks so much. Uh, for our next session, I'm delighted to be joined by Unique Jones Gibson, whose roles include being the founder of Culture Tags. Culture Tags is a game based on hashtags you might know, and some you might not, uh, the card game launched in 2020, and it's now at numerous retailers. And as Unique will share with us, there's more to come as this brand grows. Hi, Unique. Hi, Jessica. So I would love to start off discussing the growth of the brand, and then maybe we can even play with some participation from our audience. How does that sound? Love it. Great. So let's start at the beginning. How did you come up with the idea for this game? Yeah, I was online one day and I saw a very long acronym and I immediately knew what it meant with no context. And there were hundreds of comments of other people saying things like, why do I know what this means? And within seconds, I knew it was a game. I was like, this is a game. I have to make it. And so I just went down a rabbit hole doing a lot of research from that moment. So what was the acronym that sparked all of this? It was really long. It was, it was, it had some very, uh, it was very colorful. I'll say that. Um, it, it was not um, family friendly uh, or ad age friendly, but it was very long. And um, it started off with IDGAF. Um, use your imagination. It was super long. Um, and I just knew what it meant. And there were so many people who were just like, what is wrong with my brain? Like, why do I know what this means? And then I started to see them more and more. I was online and I would see them with songs. And I was at my co-working space one day and there was one written on the board and just so many different confirmations kept coming along. And while people were engaging and having fun, I thought that was great. But again, I thought that it was an opportunity to create a game that was rooted in black culture, given the fact that there weren't or aren't that many that exist. So when you started to create the game, you launched it in a way in a Twitter thread. Is that right? I did. I did. I announced it to the world in a Twitter thread. I actually used um, Kickstarter to launch it just to make sure that I could get the community behind the idea. But I started with a Twitter thread because I think Twitter is just a great platform to uh, put your thoughts into the universe to take people on a journey. And so I did a very nice thread with photos and images and videos that pretty much documented the entire experience up until that date. And that thread went viral and it allowed me to uh, be fully funded on Kickstarter, I think within like six hours or less. So how quickly did you go from the idea, the, the kernel of the idea to getting onto Kickstarter and getting onto Twitter with this? It was a couple of months. Um, 
I would say I had the idea crystallized in October, but I sat on it for a while. I was kind of like, ah, I had other, other things I was working on and doing. And then around the uh, December 2019 holiday, we have a New Year's Eve party every year uh, pre-COVID. And I got really ambitious and decided that I was going to debut it at the party just to see if my friends and family would like it. And so I did that on New Year's Eve. Everyone loved it. Someone borrowed the cards that I had, gave me feedback afterwards. And um, by January, I was putting the building blocks in place to be able to launch the Kickstarter and launch the Kickstarter at the end of January. So it was about a two to three month process. That's a pretty quick turnaround. And it is. And your kids, you mentioned your kids were involved a little bit. Your friends were involved. Uh, for people who are maybe thinking about starting their own brand or, or working on a little project at home, can you tell them what work was involved with your family and your friends getting this off the ground? Yeah, so I did a lot from trying to figure out how, how big should the cards be. And so I started to sketch things out on a pizza box. And then I started to think about games like Heads Up. I was like, you know what? I, we play those on our iPhone. So why don't I just sketch it to the size of my iPhone? And then I would have my kids stand back and I would say, can you read this? Do you, can you see these letters? And then I would say, go back again. Can you see this? And then anytime I was around family and friends, I would use it as an opportunity to give them a culture tag. I was even texting friends like my friend Lovey. I would text her and say, um, this is from a film coming to America. Do you know what it is? And we would do that for hours. And so I really leveraged my village to help me to validate the idea and to optimize it as I was building it. And how important was Black Twitter in the creation of this game? It was, it was I, don't, I don't know if I would be here without Black Twitter. Um, Black Twitter is the genesis of genius um, online and social media. And I was able to get inspiration from Black Twitter. I was able to test the game via Black Twitter. Um, a lot of the culture tags that are in, there is a Black Twitter category um, in the game because I feel like Black Twitter just puts so much um, into the universe that we all borrow from. We see it show up in articles, we see it show up in television shows and music. And I wanted a game that could really validate that and bring it to the forefront to the masses. And so uh, Black Twitter was immensely important in the creation of Culture Tags. And I would love to talk a little bit about the supply issues that came up last year with the pandemic. So you were building this game, you said it, you, you launched the, the funding for it in January, mm -hmm. uh, getting ready to launch a product that people play in person with other people uh, and then the pandemic hits. So what happened? Walk us yeah, through so, that. Yeah. So a couple of things. So we launched the Kickstarter January. It's fully funded. Kickstarter ends in February. End of February, we have this big party, right? Um, we're oblivious to what's going on in the world. And we have this big party, a culture tax game night. And at the end of that night, I was like, we're taking this show on the road. This is amazing. We're going to play it at HBCUs. We're going to sell this game. It's going to be awesome. And then I think like five days later, the country shut down due to COVID. And so we had to do a pivot, um, not only uh, when it came to teaching people or telling people how to play the game. We also had to let people know that this is a game that you can play virtually. This is a game that you can play on Zoom or on Hopin or StreamYard or whatever platform that you're using. Um, and then we also had to get really creative as it pertained to supply chain. Uh, what type of challenges were we going to encounter trying to produce a game offshore and then import it uh, and bring it into the country, given uh, some of the challenges that other manufacturers who had maybe more funding, more money, more relationships were going to be trying to do the same thing. And so uh, really just had to double down on relationships that we had developed over the course of the last almost five to six years producing products overseas with Because of Them We Can, which is my other platform, and uh, really had to plan ahead. So getting more than we needed and being really smart about how we use our profit to just reinvest in the business. And again, amplifying the fact that this was a game that people could play virtually. It would be great to take a quick clip, uh, a quick look at a clip uh, of people playing the game just to give people an idea if they're not familiar with it. Let's take a look at that video if we can. It's not really also in health. You can go to like it's also it also can be unhealthy. Right? No, you're getting close. You were know, getting, getting warm when you said head? smoothie. When you said smoothie, you're getting warm. Sick. No, something else you have really healthy, and you and something that that you get from your parents, namely your mother's side, 
and it's a drink in oh. for tomorrow again. Thank you. So once again, I'm Jessica Wall, senior reporter with Ad Age, and I'm here with Unique Jones Gibson, who is the founder of Culture Tags. Uh, Unique, in that clip, the the card was S W Y M. Wait, I'm gonna mess it up. <laughs> Check what your mama gave you, which is a phrase yes. that people would know, but when you're trying to describe it with just the letters, it becomes a little bit of a of a funny yeah. challenge. Yeah, so it's so there are seven categories um, in the game. So that was the songs and lyrics category, and his hints were interesting. But yes, it was shake what your mama gave you. You can't mention any of the words that are on the back of the card. So on the back of the card, you see the answer. Those are also words that you cannot mention in describing it. But he did a a, a really good job. But yes, it's it's amazing um, how difficult it is when you can't give certain clues. So let's give the audience a chance. Uh, first of all, if anyone has questions for Unique, please drop them in the chat. But before we get to your questions later in this conversation, I want to give people at home or at work a chance to play. How does that sound? Okay. Love it. So Unique can hold up a card. Which category is this one from? So I'm going to do one. This is, everyone should know this. Um, I'm going to do one from the 2020 expansion pack. So we have expansion packs as well. Um, this is, and I'm not going to give the answer, right? We're just going to describe it. So this is something that everyone said whenever they entered a Zoom call and they started talking, but no one could hear them. Or somebody might have said it to you. Um, 2020. All right. All right. I'll give you another one. I know we'll come back to the answer. I'll give you one from, uh, Black Twitter. All right. So this is something that you would typically say maybe to your girlfriends or your friends um, when they have something juicy that they need to tell you some gossip and you want to hear it. You are ready to lean in so that you can understand what they're about to tell you. You tell them to do this. This is also okay. a beverage. So right. if people have guesses, again, please leave them in the chat. You've seen two clues so far. So give us your best guess by leaving a comment on social. Uh, Unique, do we have one more? I have one more. I have one more. Ooh, so this is, the long daily, one. this is the long <laughs> one. And there are some really long ones in the game. A lot of times people see it and they're like, oh, that's easy. But then you get one and it has like 13 letters. All right. So this is a daily saying. When you call your friend, and you're about to talk, but you want to make sure no one else can hear what you're about to say. This is the question you might ask them. This is the question you might ask them because you don't want your voice echoing everywhere. All right. Do you want me to roll back the answers? Uh, let's give people a second right. to keep typing. Some of them might be really thinking about some of these. Okay. I'll show um, them again. There's number one. Again. Black Twitter. All right. Daily and then what saying. category is that last one from? Da this is a daily saying. Daily saying. Okay. Yes. So I think we've given people plenty of time to play along. Let's go back to the first one. Um, guessing a lot of people, especially if you're watching this on your laptop, have gotten it. Yep. There we go. Yep. That's right. <laughs> Got it. You're on mute. Okay. Number two. This one took me awesome. a second. Oh, there you go. Mm -hmm. Chanel oh, got, got it. it right away. All right, Chanel. All right. Okay. Ada. I love it. Yes. Spill the tea. You got to lean in when you say that one too. Spill All the right. Tea. Last, Last one. one. Yes, Stacy. Yes. <laughs> Whenever someone starts their conversation off with, you got me on speaker, you know they're about to spill the tea. All right. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about how the game play changed as a result of the pandemic. Clearly you had this planned as something that people were gonna have in their homes. Like you had people over for your New Year's party, right? It's, it's a card game. It's similar to something like Taboo. They're gonna be in person playing. 
then 2020 goes in is 2020. What did you do to help evolve the game to be better suited for playing without people nearby? Yeah, so the game was already created, but I think what we understood very early on was it's a real opportunity to play it virtually. So as people started to delve more into Zoom or other uh, virtual uh, platforms to connect and meet, when I played it online, I said, oh my gosh, the cards, they show properly. This would be great to play on Zoom. And so we started to shift our marketing to telling people that you can play on Zoom. And then we started to host events as well, where we were inviting people out to come play culture tags for a game night so that we could show people that this is a game that you can play virtually. And we got so much great feedback from people who were saying like, hey, I haven't seen you know my mom in six months. I haven't seen my family. But one thing that we do is on Sundays, we get together and we play culture tags. And just hearing that feedback just allowed, helped me to understand that we were in the right place with the right mindset at the right time because it really allowed it to take off even more so than it probably would have had we not been in a pandemic because it gave people something to do that still brought people together even though they were apart. So were you suggesting to people that they each buy a set of cards and have them at home and then go on video together? Yeah, people were really creative. So it was more so you just need one person to actually have the set in order to play. And so people would do like we just did and they would hold up the different culture tags. But then we heard from other people who were saying things like, you know, we had a committee and we split up. And so they would they created their own little um, uh, presentations or they would split up the cards. And so we've seen it done a number of ways where people have the games in their homes or one person has the game or one person delegates and says, okay, you're doing daily sayings. Here are your culture tags and you're doing church. Here are your culture tags. But I think it was really up to however many people were playing and how creative they were. Let's talk a little bit about the marketing strategy for this. So obviously mm -hmm. changed as you just, as you just referenced due to the pandemic, but how did you get the word out? And even maybe before we talk about marketing, let's talk about getting it into retailers, online retailers, mm -hmm and physical retailers, because that's not easy, especially uh, during 2020. So yeah. one of your big breaks I know came when you got it on the shelf at, at Target, right? Correct. Um, so Target was our first yes. Um, Target was amazing. They have an awesome supplier diversity team that connected with us, uh, took us through a present, we took them to the pre through the presentation and uh, we're able to play with them as well. And from that meeting, we were able to solidify a distributor. And I want to say the Kickstarter, we started shipping games in June, but we were also taking pre-orders. And so we were getting like anywhere from 30 to 50 pre-orders a day just from our virtual play on Instagram and our uh, virtual games that we were doing via StreamYard and Hopin. And so when we met with Target, Target loved it. And the only question that they have what well, had at the time was, can we have the exclusive? So which we said, yes. And so it went online at Target in August um, of last year. And then in November, it went in stores at Target. And then Target had exclusivity up until I think March of this year. And then in March of this year, uh, we opened up in other stores. And so now we're in Target, uh, we're in uh, Walmart, Barnes and Noble, Books A Million, Myers, uh, Kohl's, um, and many, many more to come. So there's been a quick there's been a quick response from retailers. Yeah, it's it's been a really quick response. Um, the major retailers have all been amazing in getting culture tags on the shelves. Target's been amazing not only in getting us on the shelves but also helping us. We talked about marketing. Uh, they have amazing programs for Black creators just in um, helping to fund some of the marketing initiatives that it'll take to not only ensure that the games get on the shelves, but you have to ensure that those games move and that you can sell your product once you get that exposure. And so they were great in that respect as well. What advice would you have for someone who's looking to get a, a, a product onto the shelves at, at Target or some of the other retailers that you're working with now? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is uh, know your numbers, know your margins. Um, plan for that in advance, uh, plan for uh, prices to increase with your potentially your manufacturer, your uh, your um, shipping. I know for us, uh, we saw an increase in um, shipping because of the container shortage. 
Uh, we saw an increase because the price of paper went up. So I think if you plan ahead uh, and take that into account when you're thinking about your margins, uh, you can be uh, really successful and then also build a community. I don't think that culture tags would be successful without us having built a community that could easily get behind it, even though it was a good idea, people have to know about it. And so I would work on building a community. I would work on knowing my margins. And then I would really work on having a plan to understand once you get into these stores, how are you going to ensure that you get people to either go on the website or go in their stores to purchase the product? Are you also selling direct to consumer or is it all through other retailers? We are direct to consumer as well. So we sell direct through culturetags.com, but we're also in those retailers that I mentioned, as well as on Amazon. And can you tell us how many games have been sold so far? A lot. Um, so I won't give you a specific number. I'll say this. In December of last year, we personally ordered 100,000 games and we sold out of those in Q1 alone. Um, and so we, we've sold a, a good amount of games and we're on track to do at least a million games by end of next year. Fantastic. From something that, that came up because of an acronym that you ran across and you've made it into a million box selling game. Um, once again, I'm Jessica Wall, senior reporter with AdAge. I'm here with Unique Jones Gibson, the founder of Culture Tags. So let's talk a little bit. You mentioned expansion packs. One of the one of the cards that you showed us earlier was from your expansion pack. Um, yeah. When did that come out? And oh, there you go. Yeah. Everything it's we want to forget about 2020. <laughs> <laughs> Or some of the um, things we want to forget about. Some of the things. Those are, those are all the good moments we're uh, reflecting on. Um, Because the game is all about joy, right? It's bringing so much joy to people. And that's where we're, I mean, we have tons of expansion packs planned. But we launched the expansion packs, I think, like maybe two months ago. And we've got expansion packs that are loading up from different eras like the 90s. Uh, we've got a holiday pack that's getting ready to drop. Um, the expansion packs that we have uh, that I just showed you, we have Mamas Everywhere, we have the Art of Storytelling, we got a number of them. Uh, they're ready to go on Target.com, but uh, yeah, people, once you play, you want to keep playing. And because it's about how we communicate, language uh, continues to evolve, how we express ourselves continue to, to, continues to evolve. And since it is rooted in culture, it's really um, endless. And so we are definitely cooking up more expansion packs and additions. And so far, the response has been great. What else is, is next for the game beyond expansion packs? Is there anything planned maybe digitally to play? Yeah, so we have two big things that we're working on. One, we have uh, an online version, so a web app of culture tags so that you can play digitally. Uh, the way you'll describe will be via text and via GIFs. Um, and you'll be able to play anyone in the world, anywhere in the world, as long as you have an internet connection. And so that'll go into beta at the end of um, this month. And then the other thing that we're working on is a um, culture tags game show. So we're uh, definitely working to bring this uh, game to another format so that it can reach even more people so we can continue to express ourselves and bring more joy to folks as they um, delve into this whole acronym uh, phenomenon that we've all um, uh, been able to, to, to use. All right. And there's got to be some kind of mute button or bleep or something ready for that game show, I would think. Listen, we're going to need something because the thing about this game is the funniest part about culture tags are all the wrong answers. And so people always say, is it family friendly? And I always say it depends on who's playing in the family because there are, all the culture tags are family friendly. But some of the guesses, it's really up to your imagination and how people are describing it. All right. And how does your the, your other role, so your culture brands, we should talk a little bit about, how does that play a role with culture tags? And just tell us a little bit about what else you have going on. Yeah. So um, culture brands is our overarching, it's our agency uh, where we produce and develop culturally relevant content campaigns and products. Um, and culture tags, there's no way I could have created culture tags without the data and the insights that I get from 
um, mining my different platforms, such as Because of Them We Can, or working or continuously having a pulse on the culture. A lot of times when people think about uh, Black culture, it's something that they jump in and out of, but it's something that I live and breathe and experience every single day. And it's something that I'm able to learn from every single day through the Because of Them We Can platform. And so that informs uh, sometimes the culture tags or the categories, just having that insight, but it also informs how we interact um, and produce content or products or strategies for our clients as well. Do you have clients who have come to you through the game? Has there been any breakthrough like that? Someone sees the game and tracks down who the who the company is behind it. We've had people. We've had partnerships uh, based on the game. So people who are definitely trying to partner other brands who see an opportunity to create custom culture tags or to incorporate it into something that they're doing, whether it's for their internal operations or externally. So yes, we have had people reach out um, based on the game in that respect. And how do you see the culture tags brand itself? Do you see it expanding beyond the game? Absolutely. Um, I'm pretty sure when you're having a conversation, you might use uh, an acronym LOL or whatever it is that's your favorite. Um, like my mom thought LOL was lots of love, right? <laughs> um, but we all use them. And so we see it being a lifestyle brand. Of course, the biggest thing that we want to do is we want to sell games, but we do have things like greeting cards um, because it's, you know, it adds some surprise and delight. We have uh, doormats and uh, apparel and other things that we're rolling out because we see it as a lifestyle brand, not just something that should be relegated to the game. The game is a way to gamify it and to make it fun because it's what we all do already, but we definitely see it expanding out to a lifestyle um, brand. And Unique, before I let you go, is there a new acronym, something out there that I don't know yet that I can sound cool if I use it? And for our audience, they should they should walk away with something that, you know, isn't maybe on a card yet. Maybe it's coming in an expansion pack and we need to know it first so we can win. I feel like my clients uh, might be watching this. And so I'm going to say no, because the acronym that I'm thinking, again, is not a family friendly acronym that's really popular, um, but that hasn't necessarily been put in the game yet. I'll just say that you should always Pay attention to what's happening in Black Twitter. Pay attention to what's happening in your daily life and your conversations. Just understand that the things that we say um, frequently or often are things that can be transformed and plugged into a culture tag. And so I would just say keep your ideas and your options and your imagination open. And when it's time for you to play, just make sure that you're on your A game when it comes to your hints. All right. Well, I don't think I can play against you, but definitely look forward to maybe playing at some point soon. Again, Unique Jones Gibson, founder of Culture Tags, one of this year's America's hottest brands. Thank you so much for joining me for this conversation and playing a little game with us. Uh, so it's Thanks, been great Jessica. to see you. Next Thank you. Up, I appreciate it. <laughs> next up, Studio 30 chats with one of our sponsors, Upwork. Thanks, Jessica. <laughs> Before 2020, the gig economy was still regarded by many as an outlier in the industry. But a after a year of working remotely, the lines between full-timers and freelancers have blurred. Lars Asbornsen, Asbornsen, sorry, Lars, the Senior VP of Marketing Upwork is joining me now. Lars, please come. That wasn't you, that was a bunch of cards. Hey, Lars. Hey, John, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Good, thank you. Thank you so much for joining me. Now we just, I just, you know, just to tee it up a little bit, I talked a little bit about the gig economy and freelancers and, you know, the line between full-timers and freelancers blurring. We were all working from home for over a year now. Some of us are still not back in our offices, even part-time. Um, just tell me a little bit about how, how Upwork, how you've been able to transform, help companies not just transform how they do work, but how you guys did work yourself. Yeah, so maybe I can start by kind of going back to uh, to this this 2020 and as kind of our journey. Uh, as we started 2020, we knew that as a brand, we had always been known as the you know the industry leader in terms of being a talent uh, platform. 
and as uh, and we were going up market because we, we knew there was a whole uh, whole industry, the contingent staffing industry and, tra and traditional staffing industry that we we wanted to go after, and we had to position ourselves uh, really as a challenger brand uh, in order to to do so. So we uh, we introduced the whole campaign about in, in demand, talent on demand, and how Upwork was was um, uh, was was how. But our big challenge was that what we saw with a lot of companies was that they were so. Uh, um, fearful of the unknown, and the unknown was remote, and we always had to, to challenge that that position. What happened then when COVID arrived? A couple of things. Number one, we had to do the right thing and make sure that we actually helped companies address COVID in the short term. But what we also realized that we had this incredible moment in time uh, that, in, in many ways, was a perfect storm for us, where. Um, every single company every single boardroom every single team lead in the world at the same time had were faced with the experience of, of managing remote employees and remote teams and the, at, the, at that point in time they also had this notion of if i if i'm already managing remote and i'm basically building that muscle shouldn't i be really be focused on getting the best talent regardless of where that talent exists so if i'm in the bay area do I, I no longer need to only look at you know Bay Area talent. I should be getting the best talent anywhere. So the future of work really was now and is now, and Upwork still is how. And so for, for us, it was really that opportunity. We want to make sure that the, the, we raised awareness around that to make sure that companies knew exactly what is possible on Upwork, which is how why we, we, uh, we saw the opportunity really to create an, an industry category to highlight all the various ways to upwork and what is possible to upwork for clients, but also for a lot of uh, talent and freelancers and, and folks that are actually working full time that want to try this, that there was a, a work marketplace category that, that we are shaping that provides the, the, the home for both clients and talent and to, to, to get work done. You know, when we first met, you told me that uh, 2020 was almost like three years combined to one for Upwork. And no, I, you, I, you're not the only person who's told me that. A lot of people told me that they have sped up their, their business plans by a few years, if not five years. Um, so you just mentioned about defining a new industry category. Can you go a little bit deeper into what you mean by that? And, you know, was it always part of your business plan? You know, when was that supposed to happen? Uh, were you planning on doing it now, or was it more of a case of reacting to everything that happened in the marketplace because of the pandemic? Well, I think the, what what happened was that the world changed, right? So we knew starting out, as I mentioned, coming into this, trying to really disrupt the contingent staffing industry in many ways. Uh, it was we had to overcome come that fear of of, of remote, but with uh, with the the change happening, we just saw that. We knew that lots of companies uh, have different ways of integrating freelancers into their business. And we have this whole notion of with Upwork, uh, one of our key differentiators is that you can do a range of projects really from, from gig to big. So kind of our smallest project uh, or smallest service model is around, it's called Project Catalog, where you do prepackaged projects. You have uh, our talent marketplace where you find individual freelancers and you engage with them on a project by project basis. Uh, then you have our talent scouts, um, uh, delivery model or service model where you basically let us know what you need and our talent services folks will find freelancers for you and then we have our enterprise offering so we always knew that we wanted to go there but we were we were hindered by that fear of remote so now with that re re really being completely removed and uh, we saw an opportunity for us to accelerate th those efforts and instead of trying to be better at staffing or better at something or b better at, uh, at you know being a contingent staffing firm we said this is the new way of working and we need we are the leader in in that area we need to define what that is being a work marketplace and we need to own that which is exactly what we did so it just accelerated uh, our efforts to do what we had planned all along was there any just to be truthful were there, was there a, any sense of panic on on your end <laughs> oh my oh my this is really happening a lot quicker than we had anticipated and we really need to get get our ducks in a row to kind of meet the demand i mean obviously there was a lot of demand so yeah so i would say i would not call it panic but clearly it was three years in one right because we literally had to do three campaigns and you know within one year but i think one of the things that it does is 
if you, if you think of uh, the Upwork as a platform, as a client, and we are our own biggest client, right? We have 2,000 people, 500 are full-time employees, about 1,500 are basically uh, freelancers that, that work for us, and they're, they're just part of the team. And I think the notion of, of a platform like ours, once you realize that, and I think we see this with clients now, that you can find and develop relationships with ind independent talent, basically develop your own virtual talent bench that you can engage on and off as demand and economic conditions change. Well, we have that same thing. So for us, you know, the, launching that industry category, which was really was, it went across the entire marketing org, every, you know, rebranding, um, the visitor site, uh, all, all of our materials that, you, you know, launching an industry category usually takes 18 to 24 months. We didn't make because we leveraged our own product and our own teams and we have our own virtual talent bench. And I think that to us has been the biggest uh, opportunity in terms of helping other companies see what is possible and in terms of working just the way we work as, as well, right? So yes, we knew it was a huge undertaking, but also we had great confidence in the fact that, you know, we have an unlimited scale through, through the talent on our platform. Now you mentioned the three campaigns in one year, but you also mentioned and talk about hybrid workforce. So how much of that was communicated via those campaigns and how much of it, which like you said, you're your own biggest client and you needed to, you needed to upscale your own workforce to kind of meet the demand using your own product. So how much of it was a hybrid of these marketing campaigns and also just showing potential clients, look how we're doing it. And well, how was that communicated? Yeah. So I would say, you know, first and foremost, it was really defining what exactly is a work marketplace because people, companies with tend to the talent marketplace feels very transactional one-sided a work marketplace is where talent and clients come together so the focus on our our work marketplace campaign was really defining how can talent and clients find each other develop relationships have clients really develop those virtual talent benches where they they find curate talent uh, access talent on demand as they need them and on the flip side for our freelancer and talent the fact that you can engage with with Upwork to find a predictable pipeline of opportunities and also control where, when, and with whom you work. That that was really the focus of the entire campaign. It's a work marketplace, it's a home for both clients and talent, and it's the way that, that work is, is, is happening today. I mean, truly the, the future of work is is now. And and so so for us, the, the helping companies see what is possible on Upwork has been, been the, the key focus and will be the key focus for us moving forward. I mean, we keep hearing that term a lot, the future of work. It's, I think it's one of the top five search, most searched <laughs> terms in our, in our industry, most likely, especially in the business community. Yeah. And what do you think, so do you really think that we have, that last year represented a sea change or a tipping point that this is just the way of the future now? And then is there still any reluctance on the part of any, you know, major companies or enterprise companies, especially because it really, there's a sense of startup to this right? The, the idea to be really innovative and quick on your feet, but does that, does it scale up? Can you tell me a little bit about, you know, what any of the challenges you may have had communicating that to potential clients and, you know, who are better, who are better at doing it than others? Yeah, I, I think the, um, the, the way we define hybrid is not a few people work at home, a few people work remote. It is that blend of full-time employees and that virtual talent bench of, of curated talent that you have. And what we see, and we see now the most successful companies are looking at, instead of having, thinking of talent acquisition, they have now roles that they define as talent access, like senior director of talent access. And it's just kind of that, that blended model. And the, the companies that we see that are most successful, and we have a range of companies from, from startups all the way up to, to Microsoft and Google doing this at, at a, a big scale, are the ones that basically are, are looking at what needs to be done from kind of a full-time perspective? What can be, what is, is, is scalable and should, can be upworked, so to speak? And, and they build teams around that. And I think as, as, we, as we kind of look ahead, the, the most successful companies are, are the ones that look at it that way. And I think one area in particular of particular interest for, for larger companies is this whole notion of in, you know, uh, business transformation and, and innovation that a lot of that, they have this, this notion of, of um, innovation debt in the sense that there are things that we should be, do, should be doing, but we can't because we don't have the teams 
Now, having spinning up teams using that virtual talent bench to do business transformation, to do specific projects, is also another area that we see tremendous interest and in growth. So, uh, so that combined with that infinite scale through virtual talent bench are the two key areas, and that's also where we see uh, companies having most success. I mean, one of the you know, going back to like the reason why uh, things have changed so much in the past year is that a lot of actual workers have found, and you know this from having worked with so many of them already before this all started that need to, well, you get your senses of priorities in order. There's a global pandemic, there's my family, there's my life, there's that work-life balance, and people want to have a better life. But then how does that affect these various brands? So one of the things going what you were just saying just now about the innovation debt is, part of that is it all comes down to the people and the people, not just the people you're hiring, but the people you have running your company, who are the managers, and it does, is this something that you offer? Is it a level of coaching or is it a matter of just something, you know, that you recommend that there needs to be even more leaning into that innovation uh, that that you that the managers themselves need to be more creative about the way that they approach workers and the workforce itself? Well, I mean, I think every company, regardless of size, whether you're a startup or a large company, I mean, business transformation and innovation is just something that it, it's just core. It's, it's moving so fast. And I think in order for not not to be to be left behind right now you have to have a flexible nimble uh, model in order to kind of scale teams up and down to actually not get left behind and to continue to innovate and so so i think in terms of um looking at upwork as a partner in order to do that yes absolutely they, they should but also through our our enterprise offerings we have um, we have folks that really can come in and help you um help you look at how do i actually integrate upwork in that capacity, whether that's for transformation, innovation, or just simple scale for, for certain areas of my business, whether it's web and mobile software development, marketing, creative operations, what, what have you. But really, you have to start thinking of what is that blended model? What do I need to do in-house? What can be scaled? What can be you know basically be addressed through, through nimble teams and a virtual talent bench? And companies that don't do that, I think will have a harder and harder time to really keep up with with those companies that are innovative and and are working in this way. Well, you just mentioned your enterprise, and maybe you can wrap up on this. Um, you mentioned your enterprise offerings. Without calling any of your major clients out, were there any that are there any lessons that you could pass on from some of the ones that maybe integrated better or you know uh, transformed their their business better, and those who didn't that you would you know is there any are there any lessons you could share with our audience? Yeah, I, I would say that the simplest way to think about it, you have to have a line item called talent access. So in other words, you know, a lot of the companies that we've seen do this really well, before they do, the first, one of the first things that they do when they look at new projects or scaling up, they ask themselves, can we upwork this? And they go through and look, this, you know, define the projects, define the, 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 the work that needs to get done and see, can we do this through upwork? So I think that mindset is, is, is key and number one. Number two, I think also it needs to be buy-in and sponsorship if you're gonna do this at scale at the leadership level from at least on the, on the enterprise side in order to do this. Otherwise, yes, you can use Upwork transactionally, but in order to actually use this as a way to scale your business and to scale your teams, uh, it has to be a mindset of can we Upwork it? If so, let's do that and then make it a part of how we operate as, as a team or as a business. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. Lyles Albjornsson, Senior VP of Marketing at Upwork. Thank you for a great conversation. Now I'm going to toss it to my colleague, EJ Schultz. Thank you for having me. Bye. Bye. Thanks, John. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is EJ Schultz, news editor at AdAge. I'm, I'm happy to be involved in our final panel of the day. We're going to be talking about two very interesting industries, cannabis and sports gambling, which are both on the rise, but face marketing challenges because they're both not totally legal federally. And here to talk about that are two of the hottest brands in the sector, two brands that made our hottest brands list. I want to welcome on screen Berner, who founded the cannabis brand Cookies, and Matthew Kalish, who is co-founder of DraftKings. Hello, guys. Thanks for uh, being here with us. What up? How you doing? 
Good. So uh, I'm I'm really excited to have you both because you guys are not just involved in the day to day of your brands. You actually created them from scratch. So um, before we start talking about some of your marketing challenges, I want to kind of go back and and have you each kind of talk about your origin stories, how you got involved in these brands, how you came up with the idea. Burner, I know you are multi talented. You're a rapper. You you grew up in the Bay Area. Um, how did you get involved in the cannabis business, and how did you come up with the Cookies brand? Yeah, I think it's uh, you know the same as many stories. I was passionate about marijuana, about herb. I smoked at a young age and started seeing stores all around my city, around San Francisco opened, seeing people coming out with brown bags. And we used to want to pay people to go get us bud and stuff. Um, very early on at 18, I started bud tending at a store and just started noticing that there was no brands. And I knew that this, by being in the store and – seeing the diversity of the customer, I knew that this was going to be something that was going to be uh, big and that it was going to be accepted one day. So I decided to create a brand. I didn't see anyone with a identity, with the colorway, with the logo, with the purpose of building a brand in the cannabis space. So I got the advantage early on about 20 years ago, and I've been building ever since. I've been having a good time doing it. Before we can Continue. I want to remind our viewers to submit questions in the chat and um, also want to give a few shout outs to some of our viewers. Uh, we have an international audience today. Well, we have um, Suli watching from Atlanta, Pam tuning in from um, Connecticut. We have Yasser from Egypt, Samuel from Taiwan. Thanks everyone for watching. Um, Matt, how about you? I know, you know, Sports fantasy seems very, you know, mainstream these days, but I believe when DraftKings started several years ago, it was kind of a new concept. Can you describe how you came up with the idea of launching DraftKings? Yeah, 10 years ago, there really wasn't a lot of ways if you're a sports fan to get skin in the game in the U.S. Uh, things like season-long fantasy on ESPN uh, were popular, as were maybe like a workplace pool or uh, if you were more into it, an illegal offshore sports book might have been an option. But there wasn't a lot of ways for you know fans to get closer to the games that they love. And you know, myself and my partners started DraftKings by basically combining our corporate experience, which was uh, heavily in analytics and in direct marketing, with our passions, which were uh, skill games, poker, fantasy football. Uh, and we started developing around this concept of what if you could take the best part of, of fantasy where you do the draft, you know, if you could do that every day, if you could compete against, you know, millions of customers nationally for large cash prizes, you know, we started going about like, how would that increase the experience for sports fans? And over the years, we developed new concepts around everything from, you know, the traditional sports like NFL, uh, major league baseball nba but also developed totally new games around you know ufc fantasy golf like things that really didn't exist prior to you know DraftKings really getting started and now over the last three years with sports betting emerging we found you know that's just the next uh, wave of where things are going in terms of you know engagement for the sports fan in the us and we were actually the first operator to launch in new jersey uh, first sports book outside of Nevada to operate in the U.S. back in you know August of 2018, and just been rolling from there ever since. Great, we'll come back to the the sports gambling stuff in a moment. But uh, Burner, I want to come back to you and start talking a little bit about marketing and kind of how you kind of grew your brand awareness for Cookies. Maybe before we do that, though, for folks who aren't familiar with the, the name Cookies and how that came to be, can you kind of give us the quick story? Yeah, my friend brought a new strain that we created in our garages in San Francisco, and we smoked it, and we we're that tastes like a. And we started naming things, and it just landed on a thin mint cookie, and we we just built the the brand around cookies, and so it worked out pretty organically uh, while smoking. And so um, from that moment, um, how did you begin to build the brand? And um, at that, what year was that, and where was, was was cannabis even legal anywhere at that point? Yeah, so it was medical. I was working in the, the dispensary at the time, and I started off with the with the clothing apparel. While the weed was kind of in the streets in the gray area and in dispensaries medically, you know, in the medical marijuana scene, I built the clothing brand and came with a very strong identity and a colorway and started stamping that thing everywhere. Um, I had it in people's hands, uh, you know, that, that were very influential. 
uh, athletes, musicians, actors, etc. Just the the building of cookies was very organic, and um, I just I was just was doing what I did best, which was networking, having fun, using my platform to build something strong. Uh, but I think that the music, the internet, and um, had a very big role to in cookies uh, and the organic friendships I built through the music industry for sure. I think that that sort of was the brilliance of your brand, right? Is that it's a it's it's not just a cannabis brand; it's it's a lifestyle brand in a sense, and it's you have this clothing um, uh, side of the business, which obviously you can market anywhere. There's no restrictions on marketing apparel. Can you talk about the role that that has played in kind of raising the awareness of cookies and how kind of the interplay between the cannabis and the and the clothing brand and how that works? Yeah, I think it's a, a very important part of the business because you know. A lot of people use the word lifestyle brand, especially today. And being that I'm a musician as well and that the clothing was, you know, it's it's legal in all 50 states. People would camp outside of the clothing stores and start tattooing the brand name um, on, on themselves and coming to the shows. Like it created like a real organic uh, movement. Like I kind of – and I don't want to be out of pocket by comparing, but the Grateful Dead, for instance, they weren't the most mainstream artists in the world, but – that's such an organic following through the music and it built their brand. Um, I think the clothing had a major part of, of building cookies. Cause you have to think every time someone sees someone in the streets as this was an underground thing, that shirt was a huge billboard and everywhere they went, people saw it. And so I think we're the first cannabis brand um, with, with an identity that strong with, with the clothing presence that strong. And I think it really helped catapult cookies as a business, as a, as a brand for sure. We hear a lot. The, the phrase "drop culture" has become very popular in marketing, and but I, I but I feel like that was really one of the keys to your success. How you kind of borrowed that from the you know, and you applied it to the to the cannabis world. If I'm right, can you can you explain that? Yeah, people like new things. People want to try try things that are new, that are limited, that not everyone can have. And so, as as the you know as a curator for menus of cannabis, as a cannabis smoker i want to try the new stuff all the time and so when you do a drop and you highlight what it is that you're dropping and you make an event out of it and it and it really is truly limited because there's not enough weed to go around in california even if you tried um it just it just it really works well you know so what what would be an example of one of your drop events what was one of the bigger ones you've done um well i i would like to use probably the gary payton uh we dropped the gary payton and people lined up they camped out for it and we dropped it in California, then dropped it in Michigan, then dropped it in, you know, in Nevada. And people just, they get fired up on the drops. They see it. It's, they, they hear about it. Some people get enough balls to bring it to wherever they're going. They get it tasted just once or twice. They're ready, they're ready to go to the next drop. So I think the Gary Payton drop was a very big one for sure. Gary Payton, for, for our younger viewers, is an is a NBA player from, from back in the day, played for the then Seattle Supersonics, right? How did, how did he become involved in this? I'd be curious to hear that story. That's a good story. Um, well, like any other business, there's bootlegging going on. And someone I had referenced in an Instagram story, oh, this is that number 20, this is that Gary Payton. I was with a good friend of mine, Powers Up, who is the breeder of, of the Gary Payton and just from that one mention on Instagram, someone made fake Gary Payton bags. And mind you, this was not even on the market yet. Um, and they started selling those bags in Oakland. And the word got back to Gary. And Gary, being a real one, um, you know, associated the, that Instagram story with those bags and thought I was putting out product with his name on it. He requested me with me in Oakland. I pulled up on Oakland by myself. He pulled up by himself. He showed me what people were selling. I said, Gary, that's garbage. We would never sell nothing like that. Let me show you what I was nicknaming Gary Payton. And I showed it to him. And I showed him how our bags were nice and soft touch. And I said, this is how I would do it if I were to really do it. The way they did it was corny. And he said, okay, let me give it to let me give it to you know one of my friends to see if it's really smoking. He hit me back later that evening and said, let's do it. So we did it very organically. And that's the sum of cookies as a brand. Everything has happened organically. We didn't say, let me go get a basketball player and a hall of famer and create a weed brand around him. Nah, Gary doesn't even smoke weed. He just got at me and I figured out a way to make business around an organic introduction and, and it worked incredible. I think it was the, the number one selling uh, strain of cannabis in North America last year. That's great. We'll, we'll come back and talk a little bit about some of your other partnerships in a moment, but Matt, I want to get back to you. Um, I believe just as 
as kind of the clothing brand helped propel cookies into the mainstream. Um, in a sense, you be, because you guys were involved in the daily sports fantasy, you were prepared more than most brands to, to really ramp up things when sports gambling became legal in some states after the uh, Supreme Court ruling. Can you explain, like, you know, how you, what happened when that ruling was made and what you guys did to kind of really get stuff started in these individual states where we keep seeing more, more and more states legalize sports betting? Yeah, we were pretty quick to the party. I mean, <laughs> This idea of a lifestyle brand, I think, really just means when you, you're not selling a specific product, you're serving a customer and a need of that customer. For us, it's um, our customers find thrill in risk reward. They like to predict things. They like competing in games that like aren't easily mastered or solved. Um, fantasy was one outlet of that kind of thing. But when we saw uh, the Supreme Court looking at this PASPA ruling, uh, back in 2018, and uh, New Jersey brought this case to basically uh, have the opportunity to legalize and regulate sports betting. We started working on that six months before the decision came down from Supreme Court. We were in Europe looking at what the leading sports betting platforms were in the world, uh, doing partnerships, just starting to prepare for you know the prospect that maybe this law could be overturned in the next six to 12 months. And when it did, we were ready, you know, it, I think it was May 5th or something like that, that the Supreme Court ruled. And by August 1st, we were live in New Jersey. Uh, we already had the product like mostly built. And, you know, the idea of going in that direction was really uh, obvious to us because we were thinking of it as, you know, our customer is a skin in the game sports fan. This is a new like method of engagement that many people prefer to fantasy sports. You know, the propositions are much simpler. You just pick, you know, who's winning a game over under point totals, player props, you know, a million different things that, you know, we can dream up in our office, uh, just ways for people to predict what will happen in sports events. And, you know, all of that really came from the concept though of who our customer was. So it was never really a big question in our head, like if that was an opportunity to pursue uh, or if we were just a fantasy company. So uh, we were talking with Berner about the role that, you know, partnerships have played with with his brand. DraftKings, I know you guys have been on a tear lately. You've, you've had some deals signed with the NFL. We wrote a couple of weeks back at Ad Age about something you've done with Domino's. Um, which is actually kind of getting your brand into core ma mainstream advertising. Um, can you talk about that Domino's deal? Because I think it kind of is a great example of how you're kind of getting your name out there into audiences that really are not core sports fans per se. Yeah, we, you know, DraftKings makes games. So what we found is there's a lot of interest from, you know, very large brands to advertise to our audience. You know, we have, you know, millions and millions of customers in the U.S. that, um, you know, people want to reach, whether that's Netflix or Domino's or, or whatnot. Typically, what they look for is something interactive, playable, uh, something bespoke. You know, it's not um, like DraftKings comes to mind necessarily as just a run of site advertising opportunity. They want to engage, you know, our audience with their brand with some kind of playable. So Domino's made some guarantee around, you know, the speed at which they would bring pizza out you know, for a, a pickup when people, you know, go to pick up their pizza. And so we just did an over under pool of, you know, will Domino's 80% of the time deliver the pizza within two minutes when your car shows up at Domino's, people could bet, you know, over or under. So that kind of thing is what brands really look for. You know, the relevance with our audience is really important. And I think you guys call those free to play pools. So it's, it's not yeah. technically sports betting. So you can do that anywhere. Right. And is that a way for you to, again, kind of get your name out there without having to abide by any kind of hardcore rule against, you know, advertising sports gambling in a state where it may not be legal? Yeah. Things like, you know, umbrella brand marketing sponsorships that we do. You know, we did, for example, the match Four recently, which was on Turner. This is the, you know, Tom Brady, Phil Mickelson, the celebrity golf uh, sponsorship. You know, so we do a lot of sports related kind of like sponsorships and national brand marketing which I think really just build this uh, relevance with our audience, which is DraftKings is the number one destination to go for skin in the game if you're a sports fan. The specific offerings though are different in every geography, in every state. 
So as sports betting rolls out to more and more markets, we'll be hitting maybe at a higher rate some of this marketing against the sports betting audience. But right now we're in you know 11 or 12 states with digital and you know it's going to be a slow state by state rollout. So we want to make sure that we can kind of keep the funnel warm, keep the relevance really high. So when the moment comes, DraftKings is really top of mind. Berger, back to you. I want to talk about some of your other partnerships. I know you guys have some some uh, deals with the likes of Snoop Dogg and Rick Ross. We talked already about Gary Payton. I imagine now that you guys are kind of a big name brand that you're approached all the time by folks wanting to do deals with you. And you kind of explained why Gary Payton was so successful because it kind of happened organically. So how do you deal with those inquiries? How do you decide like who you're going to partner with? Well, that comes with a lot of anxiety. Uh, everyone wants to do a deal in cannabis. It's kind of like the the now go-to thing. I just really go off who I vibe with, who makes sense, who people are not expecting. Maybe someone who didn't have the fair chance in, in build, building a brand before the right way. I just really go off vibe and energy and, and relationship. I've been friends with Snoop for a long time, and I've done work with him musically for a long time. He invited me on a very big tour back in the days, and so – it felt right to do something incredible for Snoop. And and as far as Rosé, uh, Rick Ross is a businessman as well. And we collaborated on some cool things outside of cannabis. We have a group album coming out as well. And so I just look at things that complement the brand that are real to what we're doing and are not forced. But it's all, it's all based on energy, really. Do you have any deals you want to talk about that might be coming or some unusual partnerships that people might not expect from you guys? Man, there's there's a couple really, 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 really good ones. I can't mention them just yet, but just know that we're always thinking outside the box. We're always trying to innovate and, and just stay ahead of the game. And we like to do things that haven't been done yet. So there is there is a partnership coming that will really trip people out. And I think that it's just not expected at all. And that's what I love to do. When it comes to marketing, do you does cookies do any kind of paid advertising? I know there's you know a lot of the big publicly traded companies, Facebook, Twitter, are still reluctant to accept cannabis ads. Um, do, do you see that as a hurdle, or is that just something you guys are just used to and you don't need? For me, I, I like I like the fact that we don't really pay to play too much. I really I use my platform. I've worked so hard on the music platform and and on the other things and my relationships and 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 the business as well. Like. The most that we've done is like a billboard every now and then, but you see some companies do like a $4 million uh, billboarding campaign. I can do an Instagram post that's very impactful that hits just as hard, if not harder than those billboards. So we've been blessed. We're extremely blessed for the organic marketing that we get um, just with our network. I, mean, I, I couldn't ask for anything else. It's incredible, but it's real too. You know, so we're on the ground, we're hands on. I still handle everything myself, um, which, which makes it a big difference for the company, I feel like. DraftKings, I know you guys have spent quite a bit on, on, on paid advertising. You're sort of in a marketing arms race with your main competitor, FanDuel, Matt. Um, I feel like that's sort of the Coke versus Pepsi in the sports betting business right now. How do you assess like where you need to spend your marketing dollars? And what have you, I know you guys did a Super Bowl ad last um, earlier this year or last year, and you've done some big time buys. How do you make those decisions on like where you're spending your marketing money right now? Yeah, even before DraftKings, we were doing, you know, at Vistaprint performance marketing at scale. DraftKings has that culture. It's, you know, analytics driven performance marketing where, you know, if you can invest $1 in marketing and return $2 for the company, you'll do it all day. So there's a heavy kind of test and learn culture. Uh, we invest a lot of time in, you know, how do we want to construct our media mix to make sure that, you know, our reach channels are really kind of building up our bottom of the funnel conversion and, you know, the overall system works. Uh, things always change, you know, certain partnership agreements come in with various media companies, or maybe you don't win a partnership that you want and you have to kind of reconstruct around that, you know, what your, your strategy is to reach your audience. But yeah, we think that, you know, ultimately, we want to invest as much as we can at scale within our performance criteria. And we're happy if we can find more ways to kind of invest in marketing to reach our audience and convert more users over to DraftKings. Um, you want to put you on the spot here. Can you name one thing that didn't work and what you learned from it? Um, oh, my God. I mean, over the years, like every, a million things. Yeah, it, it would be hard to kind of get into everything. But I would say like most of our testing surrounds, 
you know, how to activate customers for specific sports events, what type of promotions to put in front um, of customers, and then what are some of the best sort of ways of reaching our audience. And I don't wanna get into all of the specifics, but I think the scale we're operating at is, you know, hundreds of events per year with bespoke advertising. You probably see, you know, um, a lot of our in-house campaigns led by Jesse Cofield, who's our, you know, camera facing talent. We do all of that work in-house at a tremendous scale. And that was one of our biggest learnings was, you know, to produce the level of event specific advertising that we want in reach channels like TV or, um, you know, paid social with video. We really need to have that engine in-house humming. And so being able to do that at scale is something we've developed over the last couple of years that we're really excited about. So we only have a couple minutes left. I could talk to you guys all afternoon, but uh, we're going to have to wrap up soon. But I wanted to leave with sort of a question, uh, you know, just to go back to the beginning of this panel. And the reason we're, we're here is talking about these industries that are sort of operating at, in, a, in a space that's not quite fully legal. But let's imagine, and I think a lot of people would say this is very likely, that, that both sports gambling and cannabis will be federally legal uh, one day, if not pretty soon. How will that change your model, if at all? And, and Berner, can you can you start? Yeah, well, it get everyone uh, everyone else access to money without no risk. I mean, I, I think big banks would step in and give big loans to companies that weren't out there putting their neck out on the line. But I also feel like people like me and Matt have so much uh, knowledge and we're so ahead of um, other people that might jump in when the money boom comes because of being hands on and being on the ground for this long. Um, so it might change. For, for the better for us, because we actually not feel nervous at night when we go to sleep. Uh, that's that's my thoughts. Matt, how about you? What if, what if sports gambling is eventually legal in all 50 states? Yeah, we'll see what happens. I mean, there's tremendous demand for that with American consumers. There's a couple of referendums like in uh, Maryland and in Louisiana in the last election that had, you know, 70% approval from voters to legalize and regulate sports betting. So I don't think that there's much question that it's tremendously popular with Americans and that a federal framework would be, you know, well received. And until that happens, though, we're prepared for the state by state rollout. Uh, we built a lot of our tech stack, a lot of our, you know, go to market plans around this idea of a state-by-state -state rollout in sports betting. So that's what we're prepared for. If it goes full national at some point, though, that would be, I know, very well received. All right. Well, we'll um, we'll stay tuned for that. And I want to thank uh, both of you guys for your time today, Berner from Cookies and, and Matt with DraftKings. Thanks a lot, guys. And congratulations again for being uh, named uh, at Age's Hottest Brands for uh, 2021. Thank you. Thank you for having us as well. Take care, guys. Thank you. Um, thanks, everyone, for viewing. Um, I want to, again, thank our co-presenting sponsors, Permutive, and also Upwork. And thanks again to everyone for tuning in. I um, want to remind you to read more about the brands we discussed today. You can see the full list of AdAge's 2021 hottest brands at adage.com forward slash hottest brands 2021. Um, thanks again, everyone. Catch you next time.